Hey, Extra Historians, welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we admit our mistakes, tell you about things that didn't fit in. And with a series like this, there are a lot of things that didn't fit in. So thanks for being here. Uh, I hope that you're doing well and staying safe and inside. Uh, we're all doing okay uh, here in Hong Kong. This is our ninth week of social distancing, um, though uh, the restrictions aren't, haven't been as severe as a lot of people in the US and UK are experiencing right now. We're probably headed that way though. Um, our team is all okay, so don't worry about us. We're staying safe. Be a little bit patient. It's a little harder to do our jobs, uh, I think, as for many people now. Um, but we're, we're doing okay and, and we hope you're safe. Thanks for watching our coronavirus video. Uh, a lot of you had questions in that one, so I'm just going to really quickly answer three of them. I have a Nepal flag because I went to Nepal twice on treks. I love it there. Uh, in Hong Kong, yeah, toilet paper comes in individual wrapped like little rolls, even if you buy a big bag because they get moldy. It's so humid if you don't have that. And uh, yeah, I, I play Warhammer. I started in about 1997, second edition 40k. Uh, I'm a longtime Imperial Guard player. Uh, I also write for Black Library, if you didn't know that. So yeah. Let's get into it. Recommended reading. A lot of you asked, how can I read the travels? You can't. Not without trying really, really hard. Not unabridged. A lot of Islamic texts are not available in English. Um, and this giant thousand page book uh, that needs to be wholly translated from Arabic uh, is not super available. Uh, it is available in parts, but then also you have to worry about translation and how many notes it has, because you actually need a lot of notes to understand what's going on. Because Buddha wrote this for his world, not ours, right? If you really want to invest the time and money, uh, H.E.R. Gibbs, The Travel of I Travels of Ibn Battuta, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, from the Heculet Society, uh, Cambridge University Press. It started, the translation started in 1956. They continue today. Uh, the fourth volume is upcoming. Uh, these things are going to run you probably about 75 US dollars each on the used book market. They are quite expensive. I've seen them for even $150. Having said that, I think it's actually best to read a condensed or shortened or summarized version where a historian can kind of like talk you through what's happening and why and uh, explain all the stuff with the uh, the Mongols converting to Islam, because again, Ibn Battuta just like, this is just his world, like it's, it's just him talking about his experience. He doesn't give a lot of historical background on things, and you can get quite lost easily, uh, particularly if you are not super familiar with Islam. Um, so what I read that I found really helpful was The Adventures of Ibn Battuta, A Muslim Traveler in the 14th Century by Rossi Dunn. It has a lot of the, the travels and the context with liberal quotes from uh, from the travels. To supplement that, uh, you can use the website Ibn Battuta Travels in Asia and Africa 1325 to 1354 from Fordham's Medieval Sourcebook, which is an amazing resource. Uh, it does not, it's not a full text, but it has large uh, notable sections quoted. Uh, the Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta by Tim McIntosh Smith, also Travels with a Tangerine, which is a travel book based on it. He also did a great documentary called Ibn Battuta, The Man Who Walked Across the World, which in 2007, 2006, 2007, he retraced uh, parts of Ibn Battuta's journey, for example. He did not go to Baghdad in 2006, 2007. Probably a smart decision, but there are large parts of the, the, the trip that he, he goes on. And, uh, it's, a, it's a very cool documentary. It's on YouTube. Um, so, general stuff. Some of you asked, where did Ibn Battuta actually like? A lot of places. He particularly loved Cairo, called it the mother of cities. He really loved Anatolia and what is now Turkey. The Maldives he was very complimentary of, particularly how easy it was to get married and how cheap dowries were. Uh, we have a new thing. Our Patreon got restructured. So one of the patron uh, perks is that you can ask questions directly for lies. Uh, we had one patron question. Uh, this is from Marina. Besides Ibn Battuta's travels, what are other primary sources about the Islamic world in this time period that scholars consult? Is there any possibility that his travels may have been embellished in a similar way to those of Marco Polo? There are a lot of sources from this period. The problem is not all of them are translated to English. Uh, the short answer is sometimes yes, there are other sources, sometimes no. He 
covered a huge amount of the world. So uh, for the Delhi Sultanate, we have the writings of Zayedin Barani, who was a scholar who was very close to Muhammad Tughluq. He was not necessarily in his government, but he was sort of nearby. And he wrote uh, a history of the, the Delhi Sultanate in general. But a lot of it focused on Muhammad Tughluq because he knew him personally. Uh, for the Kilwa Sultanate on the Swahili coast, we have chronicles, but we also have the architectural, archaeological evidence of their coral mosques and palaces and things like that, which are very neat. Um, Ibn Khaldun, who lived in Tunis, was a major source for the Black Death in, uh, in the Muslim world. But there are other places like Mali and the warrior queen Odura uh, and uh, some other small kingdoms where Ibn Battuta is the only source we have. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to fact check him on occasion. Uh, were the travels embellished? Oh yeah, we'll talk about that later. Strong asks, do we know how many times he was married and divorced? Ten. That we know of. In the travels. Probably got married when he, when he got back to Sanjir. Ooh, I forgot to count the kids. There are a lot of kids. There's at least three I can remember. Uh, episode one, we had a great correction, uh, which I'm so sorry about this one. Muslims don't bow to the footprints of Abraham near the Kaaba uh, when they're on the Hajj. Instead, they pray and bow down to the God of Abraham near the Kaaba. So, yes, this is a absolutely fair distinction. I should have caught it. Um, actually, when it, that was said, I went, oh, we didn't actually, we didn't put that in there, did we? And I looked. Yep, we did. I missed it. Sorry. Um, down the Nile versus up the Nile, we obviously meant down as far as the map, not, you know, the Nile. Up the Nile is down because of the flow, and down the Nile is, is north. On our maps, Mecca is too far south. Our maps are an abstraction. Uh, if we had absolutely geographically accurate maps, the artists would spend their whole time just doing like two or three maps uh, when they have to do a whole episode. So really, we, we make a map that is good enough to convey the information that we're trying to convey. Uh, Atlantic trade in the 14th century? Uh, yeah, there is an Atlantic trade going down to Africa and up to the Atlantic coasts of Europe. Obviously, we're not talking about the transoceanic trade uh, at this point. The saying, Seek knowledge even unto China. This is a really interesting one because it is frequently attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. But my research led me to believe, or at least to find, that there's a large belief that this is a misattribution, that Muhammad never said this, this is not in his writings. Um, so I just didn't want to get in the middle of that, frankly, um, because... Like, I did not focus on studying Islam when I did my religion degree. Uh, I, you know, know from research uh, to a certain extent about Islam, but I don't, I'm not a specialist in any way, um, and I'm not a member of the religion. That felt like a conversation that I, I didn't want to interpose myself in the middle of, like, I'm not a good arbiter for that. So I just did not attribute it um, and let people think what they would. But there's debate about it, whether he actually said it or... Uh, this is a misattribution. Episode 2. No one pointed out anything in this episode, which is so rare. But I'm just going to point something out myself, which is when you see Ibn Battuta getting all these riches from traveling around, um, and a lot of them are like, hey, you traveled a long way to get here. Here's something to cover your expenses, right? It's, it's part of the hospitality culture. And uh, you understand why... When he got to Mali, especially after that long, expensive, arduous journey, and he gets given, like, a bunch of yogurt, uh, he's like, what is going on with this place? This is terrible. Uh, because, like, I, I don't... I, how am I supposed to even get myself a place to live here if you're not giving me something to cover my expenses? Uh, so it's a little more understandable why he, he feels that uh, the Empire of Mali is quite rude to him. Episode 3. Patron question. Alex asked, why did the bell scare Ibn Battuta? So, in uh, Ibn Battuta, the man who walked across the world, there is a section explaining that there was a medieval Muslim belief that the sound of bells drove away angels, and it was considered, like, almost satanic, uh, which is very interesting, right? I thought that was very cool. However, there was something about it that didn't quite ring true to me. Unintentional pun, sorry. Uh, so I checked it out with a couple of my Muslim friends and family members, 
And they were basically like, Mur? like, we've never heard of this. Uh, maybe that was a localized belief uh, in North Africa, or this is just something that was thought of in the Middle Ages that is not around anymore. They'd never heard of it. I couldn't really come up with anything on it. So I didn't go that in depth to it. But yeah, he was religiously terrified by these bells to the point where he runs to the top of uh, one of the towers in the mosque and starts chanting the call to prayer to counteract it. And a bunch of his friends from the mosque like run up and grab him and literally drag him down the stairs because they're like, you're going to cause a sectarian incident. Like people are going to get mad and storm the mosque. Um, so yeah, <laughs> like, but apparently he, he thought bells were absolutely terrifying. Uh, and did Ibn Battuta have a daughter in eight months on his way to India? No, the journey took eight months and he had his daughter. It's quite a sad story, actually. So one of his concubines has this daughter and Ibn Battuta like kind of considers him or her his, his lucky charm. Uh, she comes and everything seems to get better on the expedition for a while and they actually make it to India uh, and they end this arduous journey. And then she passes away like two months after they get to India. Um, and you can sense how sad he is about this. Um, and actually, originally it was, it was in the script, but I was just like, oh, it kind of distracts from what was going on there. So I, I pulled it out. Uh, amazing stuff from Indian viewers about uh, Muhammad Tukluk. Uh, apparently there's a famous book about him called The Wisest Fool, which is an amazing title that perfectly fits. Uh, also, Tukluk in India today is still an insult. Uh, it's particularly, you would say, a government action is, is Tukluk or is it Tukluk? in that it's insane or stupid and just doesn't make sense. I think Mohammed Tugluk is fascinating because he is in many ways like a very forward-looking, interesting, almost kind of enlightened figure on one hand. <laughs> like all these ideas like coins that are backed by gold. Um, and uh, I mean, paper currency is already going on in China, right? There's already even a precedent. Um, moving his capital further south so that it's not as vulnerable to invasions from the north. He has Mongols on his northern border, right, who invade very early in his reign. And because he wants to govern uh, and rule southern India, like moving his capital a little bit south might help with that. Uh, the problem is he wants all this stuff to happen tomorrow. Like he gets the idea and he wants to do the idea immediately, no matter what. Uh, and either of those things probably could have worked if he had used his entire reign to do maybe like one or two of those projects. But instead, he just like forces them immediately as quickly as possible and just utterly ruins them and like messes up really badly. Uh, the coins were so easy to counterfeit that people were just doing it in their houses and the currency just totally, totally crashed. Chinese merchants write the China India trade is super important don't want them. Like, what are they going to do with those back in China? Right? Nope. Um, and there are varying accounts of whether he forced just his court or the entire population of Delhi to just like march down the road to the new capital. Um, but either way, it was really disruptive and basically just earned him a bunch of enemies and the whole project was a big failure. Probably should have used a little more carrot and less stick. He used a lot of stick with a very big spearhead on the end of it. Um, but yeah, he, he's just like sort of a fascinating guy with this almost, I hate this term, but he has kind of like a, like a bit of a split personality, right? There's the side of him that's very forward thinking and interesting and uh, a little bit like religiously tolerant in a way that kind of bothers his Muslim court uh, and bothered Ibn Battuta, um, inviting Hindu and Jain, you know, uh, uh, mystics and holy men over to her. We can have dinner with them and talk about religion. Um, and then there's this other side where he's just like a horrible tyrant, right? And his th th throw it was the execute FYI, it was the execution elephants that really made me be like, I we have to do this, we have to do this series. Like this thing about Muhammad Tugluk like throwing people to elephants with swords on their tusks. And Ibn Batuta's whole like, I've totally arrived, this is great, everything's gonna be awesome from here on out. And then the execution elephant comes out and he's like, oh no. Uh, it was just such like a curb your enthusiasm moment. I was like, this is, this is great. We have to do this series. It's hilarious. Uh, episode four, Ibn Battuta's amphibious assault. So yeah, he fights in this amphibious assault where he goes ashore in a boat and they're making a beach landing in front of a fortress that's flinging 
like catapults are flinging boulders at them. Uh, and he's doing this because he has essentially like ditched his mission to go to China after he loses all the gifts to the emperor and decides that he's going to find a new patron in, in southern India. And uh, he fights in this battle and doesn't really distinguish himself. But it very quickly becomes clear that like this sultan sucks at war and is going to lose the war. And uh, yeah, Ibn Pu just kind of like ghosts. <laughs> he's like, all right, bye. <laughs> like, I'm going to go to China. All right, plan B abandoned. Back to plan A. Uh, I'm so sorry to say Queen Udura is probably fictional. Um, this may be one of those sections that, um, that Ibn Jazay inserted. Uh, there is an alternate explanation, which is, uh, he was not in the Philippines, though in the Philippines, uh, Queen Adura is, is considered this, this very, uh, historical but also mythological figure, uh, that is, that is a national hero. Um, there's this competing theory that where he actually was was Java, and he's talking about Queen Katarja, who we mentioned in our Majapahit series. Maybe. Um, or he was drawing on things he'd heard about her, or it's uh, an account from a different traveler that's been inserted. So, I don't know. Like, so it's possible that we've already done an episode on her. Uh, we might, maybe we do an extra mythology episode about her. Ibn Battuta has the worst luck and the best luck. Yeah, there's been some questions about this. There's a bunch of questions about the Southeast Asian section of the books, actually. Um, so there are some people who don't think that all these pirate attacks happened in these amazing swings of luck where he gets rich and then poor and then rich again. Uh, I wanted to include them because they're not quite as disputed as, for example, going to Beijing. Uh, so I, I put them in and also, also they're just like fun. Like, I just really enjoyed that section, and I would have been sad to cut it. Episode 5. Marina asked how, uh, this is a patron question, how have modern historians obtained the death estimates for the Black Death shown in the episode? So a lot of them are from a book called The Black Death in the Middle East, um, which we'll talk about a little later, but uh, these are estimates by historians. Some of their sources, I assume, are, are from uh, contemporary accounts. Others are, apparently one thing he the author did to get these numbers is to estimate, take like the economic output before the plague and then after the plague, and then figure out how much of workforce loss would have, uh, would have created this. So some things like losing X many a day, like can be from the travels or like Ibn Khaldun or something like that. But like a lot of the big numbers of 200,000 people, like that's, that's likely an estimate. These things get argued about, even in Europe, where we have very good sources from it, uh, translated into English, people argue about death rates for the Black Death a lot. Um, it's very high. Did the Black Plague come from China? Well, so it's generally thought to be S Central Asia or East Asia. So Central Asia kind of means more like the Afghanistan region. Um, and a lot of more modern accounts suggest Central Asia rather than East Asia. So that it went to China along the Silk Road and, you know, went west kind of at the same time. Um, and then, you know, famously arriving in Venice via ships, right? What killed the Ilkhan? So we said plague because that's probably what actually happened, but Ibn Battuta, like, goes through this very convoluted story about how he was poisoned by one of his jealous wives. So, I don't know. Like, it was plague, but it's a fun story. Um, know who else died of plague? So, you know when Ibn Battuta goes to Gibraltar to fight in a battle to defend it from the Spanish, and he gets there and, like, the battle's o over? The reason the battle's over is that uh, King Alfonso XI of Castile, who was besieging Gibraltar, got the plague and died, and basically, like, the, the camp just dissolved overnight. Like, so the Spanish, like, the king died and everyone left. Um, and apparently he had refused to retreat when the plague came up in camp. He was like, no, we're going to stay. And then he gets plagued and dies. And all his captains are like, eh, bye. How do we know what in the travels it really happened and what is made up? Basically, we have to tri triangulate between three things. One of them is, does it square with what we already know um, about the period and the area? Uh, how solid are the details that Ibn Battuta is getting? Because sometimes he gets real hand wavy and you're like, hmm. 
is that so? This doesn't sound like someone who's been there. This sounds like someone who might have read or heard about a place. Um, he sometimes says stuff that is clearly not true, like that pearl divers in the Persian Gulf can hold their breath for an hour while, you know, getting pearls off the ocean floor, um, which is something he likely heard rather than witnessed himself. Um, but then the other thing is like timelines. So it's, it's what we know, whether he gets hand wavy or it sounds like an account that came from somewhere else, because Ibn Jazay looks like he basically just like lifted parts of other books to put in the travels, and whether the timelines make sense. So like the timeline for getting to Beijing doesn't make sense, and some of the details are like super wrong, and uh, uh, a lot of it is very like hand wavy. Um, so like probably never went to Beijing, which is why we don't put it in the series. Same thing with him going deep into Russia, which again is why it's not in the series. Those are the two biggest disputed journeys. There are people who say he never got past the Maldives. So that could be a thing. Like the whole journey to Southern China is sometimes put into doubt, but it's more consensus than like the Beijing journey. That's kind of it. Coming up on Extra History. Uh, first of all, wasn't that one-off cool? Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Jack. And for taking uh, sometimes kind of rough material and making a really good, great uh, episode out of it. If it made you interested, read Eaters of the Dead. It's good. It's, it's very... It's in the style of Ibn Fadlan, who's not always like the greatest writer. Persevere through the beginning and it's worth it. Lots of footnotes. After that, coming up next week, is Dividing the Middle East. We'll be talking about the Young Turk Revolution, T.E. Lawrence and the Arab Revolt, King Faisal, uh, Gallipoli Winston Churchill. It's Gertrude Bell, like, it's kind of crazy how many people show up in this that I, I did not expect. I probably learned more doing this series than anything else I've written for Extra History. Um, and you see, a, like, the foundation of Saudi Arabia by Abdulaziz ibn Saud and the British fighting a counterinsurgency in Iraq. That sounds very familiar when you get into it. Uh, the 1918 flu pandemic shows up because we couldn't avoid it. Sorry. Um, after that, it's exploring the Pacific, so we're doing Austronesian migration, how these people from Taiwan managed to get all through the Pacific Islands. Uh, we talk about traditional wayfinding techniques. Um, and European explorers like Magellan, Tasman, Cook. Uh, after that, we're going back to Rome. We have not voted on that series yet. Uh, I'm looking at the topics that were suggested right now. It's going to be lots of fun. I feel like we need to do a fun series with no epidemics in it. Uh, I feel like we all kind of need a little escape in us, and it had been a while since we've done a Rome topic, so I, I figured it was about time. Uh, you can join us on Patreon. We have a restructured Patreon that gives out more uh, rewards and also gets you extra mythology early in addition to extra history. You can ask us questions in quarterly Q&As. You can talk to us on a, a Discord server. Um, it's all sorts of really cool stuff. Uh, we have a great community over there. Thank you for being a part of it. Oh, and of course you can suggest topics and vote for topics. So. That's really neat. Um, we're not going to do a Walpole fact for this one because we're running a little dry on Walpole. We've been doing Walpole facts for like five years now. Uh, and we're starting to like kind of tread ground we've been before. So we're introducing a new segment. We're going to try it out called Ibn Battuta's Side Trip, where I just kind of like go off on sort of a side thing that was really interesting, but we couldn't really mention in the series. And this is actually from a patron question. Um, from Marina, could you detail a little bit better why the population in Western Europe and uh, the Middle East differed in their how they treated the plague religiously? So the leading historian of plague in the Middle East is Michael W. Doles, whose book The Black Death in the Middle East has a great a bunch of great stuff on this. It's an academic text. It's very expensive to get a hold of. It's like $150. But there are some articles uh, that talk about some of its points free online, and one of the points that uh, one of the articles talks about the religious and societal differences between uh, the Middle East and Western Europe, which uh, which created these differences. And one of these is that so early on in uh, in the expansion of Islam, uh, when Muhammad was still alive, there was an epidemic. Uh, in the Middle East that struck his forces. And as a result, there are actual religious laws and uh, and sort of religious doctrines surrounding how you should treat an epidemic disease. 
And there are three main things. The first is that the plague isn't a judgment. It's a mercy from God. And the dying of it is a form of mar martyrdom on par with dying in battle. So it's not uh, a bad thing. Like, if you die from plague, as long as you are a good Muslim, you can be assured that, that you, will, uh, you will live on in paradise, right? Uh, so there's not this, like, existential religious terror that takes hold, like in Europe. Like, what did I do wrong because I have the plague? Um, the second thing is that there's essentially like quarantine orders. Um, you're not supposed to enter a place that has uh, a plague. You're not supposed to leave a place that has plague if you're already there. Now, obviously this was not followed as we saw in episode five. Like people are running all over the Middle East trying to escape this. Um, the Mamluks, Ibn Tuta himself is like ping, pinballing between the cities being like, uh oh. Um, but theoretically this is what you were supposed to do and that probably helped with containment a little bit. Um, but also, third, since the plague comes directly from God, and we don't necessarily just mean the Black Plague, but any epidemic disease, since it comes directly from God, it's not a negative thing. There's not a, con st there's not a stigma of contagion associated with it. Uh, that it is also a creation of God and that it's to be born, you know, and sometimes it's a trial, but, you know, you, you sort of bear it with humility. So you have this difference uh, with a society that is is just like kind of trying to endure and get through this. Whereas in medieval Europe, which is very associated with sin and judgment and uh, God and the devil directly intervening in human lives, there is this explosion of, you know, the flagellant movement and particularly religious violence against both religious minorities like uh, Muslims and Jews, but also grave diggers and lepers, like people kind of on the outskirts of society, witch hunting, um, apocalyptic uh, predictions. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a very stark contrast, and it's fascinating. I highly recommend reading that article. We'll link it. Uh, all right, thank you very much for joining us today. We ended the series with have fun on your travels, which nobody's having right now. Sorry we created these before coronavirus really became a huge thing across the world. So uh, what I'm going to say is stay safe, stay inside, and uh, we'll see you next week. Legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, El Mawawin Chikawi, and Oriels One.